Moon, shit, sky. Sea otter, sandalwood, and beche de mer. Chanterelles, puffballs, chicken of the woods. Mud, roots, old cartridges, and blood. What is more objective, what is more personal, than the making of lists? To list is to desire. It says so in my Oxford English Dictionary. Therefore, man must be the listing animal. He tilts precariously like a ship on rough seas. He listens. He hears. Autumn, death, the cold comfort of reason, and clitoral orgasm. Black turbans, angular green whelks, the world opalescent unicorn. To list is to enclose, bound, or limit. In old times, it meant a place of combat. And in the agricultural sense, to list is to prepare the land for the crop by making furrows with the plow. Beds and alleys with a hoe. Blackberry, blackberry, blackberry. You've probably noticed by now that these are not my words. In Robert Haas's poems, one thing follows another. His work gathers the unruly material of this world into the rhetorical fraternity of the poetic line. The glories strung like beads, as Whitman would say, while resisting our human impulse to subordinate, to impose regulation, to dominate experience. There is a deep poetry of sequence and consequence in this work. We see this in the narratives which open and open, one story turning into another with the unexpected wonder of physical pleasure. Or theological grace, until you forget where you began, and who you thought you were when you began. If you're sitting at a table in a Berkeley cafe, trying to write a poem about spring, and you see a woman strike her child, it may be best not to intervene. She may take the child home and beat her again, out of humiliation. Your mind. May wander to the county fair. You may remember driving home at midnight after making love long ago, and how that led, sequence, consequence, to raindrops bouncing off raindrops on a dead man's face. Pulleys, levers, the separation of powers, auxiliary verbs. Fish bones, a fine carelessness. The mammoth jawbone in the entry hall, Napoleon in marble, Meriwether Lewis dead at Grinder's trace. Beard tongue, stone crop, pearly everlasting. Robert Haas's awards, honors, and services not only to the world of poetry. But to the fields of literacy and environmental sanity, are too numerous to list here in their entirety. But they include a MacArthur Genius Fellowship, two National Book Critics Circle Awards, one in 1984 for 20th Century Pleasures, his book of criticism, <coughs> and again in 1996 for his poetry collection, Sun Under Wood, and the selection for the Yale series of Younger Poets for his first collection. Field guide. One must add that he was poet laureate of the United States from 1995 to 1997. All the while, he has been quietly foraging through the natural world, through Eros, through the Chekhovian historical epic of the domestic life, and knowing full well that this can only lead to the heartache of loss in the end. Choosing praise over renunciation of the things of this world. 
This is the watchful and enduring humanity of his work. If you listen carefully to his words, they will leave you more emotionally awake, gentled and open. Sap, wine, breast milk, sperm, and blood, earlobe, the lap of an eyelid, and the dreams. Bees in the heart, then scorpions, maggots, and then ash. Pines, lawn, the bay, a blossoming apricot. Please join me in welcoming Robert Haas. Thank you very much. That may be, that's probably the best poem that you're going to hear <laughs> tonight. I learned something about myself. I didn't know that about my poems. I always thought it was my favorite thing about Faulkner was sets of three in his work. Um, most, about half of us have been talking about poetry nonstop since 9.30 this morning. <laughs> and um, um, are only here to be nice because they've already heard enough. Um, And I want to thank those of you who um, um, are staying and uh, welcome those of you who are new to this day. It was a day of completely fascinating conversation about the poetry of Louis Zukoski. It was partly just interesting because of that man's isolation and determination as a poet through so much of his life. We started with the poems he was writing in the, as a graduate of just fresh with an MA from Columbia University in 1924. Um, the poems that he wrote then, the gathering together the anthology that made the objectivist poets, the work on this lifelong process poem, epic poem called A, um, the late strange homophonic musical poems, um, talk by young poets who are kicking off of him, by critics, by... Anyway, it was really wonderful. And those of you who didn't get to hear it, um, a reason to... Um, something to do in relation to this is to, is to read the poetry of Lou Zukowski. It's one of the things that we do is... Um, as poets, is pay is guard tend to the tradition, and that's what we were doing. I'm going to read one poem of Louis Zukowski's. He wrote a book on Shakespeare called Bottom. Um, this is Bottom speaking. Millennium of sun, beast of the fields, kissing the beast upon both ears. Oh, who will pluck geranium with smiles before this ass's face and tie it to his cranium? to match the ass's grace. I thought that um, that would be a place to start. (laughs) (laughs) My um, friend Chesov Miwosh died this August in Krakow. Um, He was born in Lithuania in 1911 on his mother's father's farm. And if you walked down the slope of the bank from the house to the river, you could get in a canoe um, and uh, go about 200 kilometers in four hours to the city of Vilno in Polish, Vilnius in um, um, Lithuania, where Isaac Boschva Singer was uh, being born in the same year. And if you got in the canoe again and went another 200 kilometers south, another four hours or so, you'd come to the shtetl of Most, where Louis Zukowski's father packed up and moved the family to Manhattan in 1899. So thinking about Louis Zukowski all day, I found myself thinking about Chesov. He, uh, he was 93 years old when he died. Um, at the age of 90, he was still writing poems, and I'll read one or two of them. Just for a sense of what you might write poems about at the age of 90 and to remember my friend. 
at the end, he was in Krakow. I was in Berkeley. He would send me rough versions of the poems. This one was called O. Oh. So I emailed him and said, do you mean O oh, exclamation point or O H exclamation point? And he emailed me back and said, we better do this on the phone. <laughs> so, so I phoned him and, and said, he was, pretty, he was almost completely deaf at that point. So I said, Chasov, do you mean oh or oh? And he said, oh, for sure. He would yell back. <laughs> when I was yelling at him. So this poem is called Oh. Oh, happiness to see an iris, the color of indigo as Ella's dress was once and the delicate scent was like that of her skin. Oh. What a mumbling to describe an iris that was blooming when Ella did not exist, nor all our kingdoms, nor all our domains. He went on to do a series of these, and all the rest of them are based on paintings. I'll just read one more. Um, and this one is called, Oh, Gustav Klimt, 1883-1918, Judith <laughs> Detail, Österreich Museum. Do you, do you, some of you undergraduates might not... Do you have an image of who Klimt is? The really sexy paintings? This poem is about the fact that all of the young guys in World War I went into those trenches with his sexy images in their heads. Oh, Gustav Klimt. Oh, lips half opened, eyes half closed, the rosy nipple of your unveiled nakedness, Judith and they rushing forward in an attack with your image preserved in their memories, torn apart by bursts of artillery shells, falling down into pits, into putrefaction. Ah, massive gold of your brocade, of your necklace with its rows of precious stones, Judith, for such a farewell. Appropriate enough to these days. So this morning I read a little... Um, a uh, poem to Lenin by Zukovsky. This is a little poem by, from, from, by me to Chesov, for Chesov Miłosz in Krakow. The fog has hovered off the coast for days and given us... I'm sorry, let's start again. The fog has hovered off the coast for weeks and given us a march of brilliant days you wouldn't recognize who grumbled so eloquently about gray days on Grizzly Peak, unless they put you in mind of puppet pageants your poems remember in Lithuanian market towns just before the First World War. Here's more theater. A mule tail doe gave birth to a pair of fawns a couple of weeks ago, just outside your study in the bed of Ixalis by the redwood trees. Having dropped by that evening, walking down the path, I saw, though I couldn't tell at first what it was, I saw a fawn, wet and shivering, curled almost in a ball in the thicket of Toyon and Hazel. I've read somewhere that the does hide the young as best they can and then go off to feed and recruit themselves. They can't begin to nurse until they graze. They can't graze the juices in the leaves if they stay to protect the newborns. It's the glitch in engineering through which chance and terror enter on the world. I looked closer at the fawn. It was utterly still and trembling, eyes closed, possibly asleep. I leaned down to smell it. There was hardly a scent. She had licked all traces of the rank birth smell away. I'm sorry. Um, she had, she had um, licked all traces of the rank birth smell away. Do you remember these lines from Anacreon, the context is probably erotic. Her, frankly, like an unweaned fawn left alone in the forest by its antlered mother, frail, trembling with fright. It's a verse 
you will like this detail, found in the papyrus that wrapped a female mummy some museum in Cairo was examining in 1956. I remember the time in Portland that a woman asked if you were a reader of Flannery O'Connor. You winced regretfully, (laughs) shook your head, and said, you know, I don't agree with the novel. (laughs) I think you haven't, in this same sense, agreed with life. You You never accepted the cruelty in the frame of things. That story of God the monster and the maimed world and its poor salvation in the word. You picked up one weapon after another in your effort to resist it. Dear friend, you did resist. You were not mute. As for the deer, Marcus seen the fawns grazing with their mother in the dusk. They're gorging on your roses, in fact. So it seems they made it through the night and no dog or car has got to them just yet. (coughs) For Chesov. I see a couple of my students from Iowa here. Here's, 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 I'm a California boy. Here's my Iowa winter poem. Iowa, February. In winter, a man's dreams are narrow. Over and over, he enters the furrow. Uh, After truckle, for this time of year, November night, the sun gone down, evening with its brown and blue, music from another room, evening with its blue and brown, October night, the sun gone down. Envy of other people's poems, having read Zukowski and Miłosz to you. In one version of the legend, the sirens couldn't sing. It was only a sailor's story that they could. So Odysseus, lashed to the mast, was harrowed by a music that he didn't hear. Plungings of sea, wind shear, the offshore hunger of the birds, and the mute women gathering kelp for garden mulch, seeing him strain against the cordage, seeing the awful longing in his eyes are changed forever on their rocky waste of islands by their imagination of his imagination of the song they didn't sing. This is another um, hero poem, A Supple Wreath of Myrtle. Poor Nietzsche in Turin, eating sausage his mother mails to him from Basel, a rented room, a small square window framing August clouds above the mountain, brooding on the form of things the dangling spur of an alpine columbine, winter tortured trunks of cedar in the summer sun, the warp in the aspen's trunk where it torqued up through the snowpack. Everywhere the wasteland grows. Woe to him whose wasteland is within. Dying of syphilis, trimming a luxuriant mustache, in love with the operas of Bizet. Futures in Lilacs. This is an investment strategy poem. (laughs) Futures in Lilacs. Tender little Buddha, she said, of my least Buddha-like member, She was probably (laughs) quoting Allen Ginsberg, who was probably paraphrasing Walt Whitman. (laughs) After the Civil War, after the death of Lincoln, that was a good time to own railroad stocks. But he was in the Library of Congress researching alternative Americas, reading up on the curiosities of Hindu philosophy, studying the etchings of stone carvings of strange couplings in a book. 
She was taking off her blouse, almost transparent, the color of a silky tangerine. From Capitol Hill, Walt Whitman must have been able to see willows gathering the river haze in the cooling and still humid twilight. He was in love with the trolley conductor in that summer of, what was it, 1867, 1868? Can you hear me in the back? This is a poem about jealousy. It's called The Distribution of Happiness. Bed covers thrown back, tangled sheets, lustrous in moonlight, image of delight or longing or torment, depending on who's doing the imagining. I know you are the one pierced through. I'm the one bent low beside you, trying to peer into your eyes. Bless the world if you could stand in all three places or let it go. This is uh, called Etymology. I was writing a poem that you uh, quoted a bit of in which the argument of the poem required me to list bodily fluids. Um, And so there's a passage that goes like this. The body's fluids and solids, its various despised disjecta, toenail pairings left absently on the bedside table that your lover the next night notices there, skid streaks in underwear, or little faint odorous pea blossoms of the palest polleny color, the stiffened small droplets in the sheets of the body's shuddering late-night loneliness and self-love, Russets of menstrual blood, toe jam, earwax, phlegm, the little dead militias of white corpuscles we call pus, what are they, after all, but twins of the juices of mortal glory, sap, wine, breast milk, sperm, and blood? I wrote. (laughs) And then thought, there's not a word here for something I needed. So this is a little contribution to the English language and it's called etymology. Her body by the fire mimicked the light-conferring midnights of philosophy. Suppose they are dead now. Isn't dead now an odd expression? The sound of owls outside and the soughing of wind in the trees is packed in their brain pulp, sent out in scouting parties of sensation down their spines. If you say it became language or it was nothing, who touched whom? In what hurdle of starlight? Poor language, poor theory of language. The shards of skull in the museum look like maps of the wind-eroded canyon labyrinths from which Standing on the verge in the yellow of a dwindling fall, you hear echo and re-echo the cries of terns fishing the worked silver of a rapids. What to say of such wetness? The Anglo-Saxon had a word for it. They called it silm. They were navigators. It was also their word for the look of moonlight on the sea. which leads into other problems about the problem of description. This one is called the problem of describing color. If I said, remembering in summer the cardinal sudden smudge of red in the bare gray winter woods, if I said, red ribbon on the cock straw hat of the girl with bee-stung lips who holds the wiry, red-tongued lapdog to her hip in the painting by Renoir, if I said fire, if I said blood welling from a cut, 
or flecks of poppy in the tar grass scented summer air on a windstruck hillside outside Fano. If I said her one red earring dangles from her silky lobe, if she tells fortunes with a deck of fallen leaves until it comes out right, rouged nipple, mouth, how could you not love a woman who cheats at the tarot? Red, I said, sudden, red. The problem of describing trees. The aspen glitters in the wind and that delights us, flinging its coin of light through afternoon. I, I cut that light. Wait, you didn't hear it. It's out. <laughs> the problem of describing trees. The aspen glitters in the wind and that delights us. And the leaf flutters, turning because that motion in the heat of summer protects its cells from drying out. Likewise, the leaf of the cottonwood. The gene pool threw up a wobbly stem, and the tree danced, no. The tree capitalized, no. There are limits to saying in language, from the tree's point of view, if the tree has a point of view, what the tree did. It is good sometimes that poetry should disenchant us. Dance with me, dancer, Robert Duncan said. Oh, I will. Mountain, sky, the aspens doing something in the wind. This is called Brief Primer on Energy Policy or Why the Relationship Between Neon and Prostitution is Ecological. <laughs> because the World Bank greenlights the dam, and the dam floods the village, and the villagers find their way to Bangkok where their daughters melt into the city streets, and the dam's great turbines, beautifully tooled in Lund or Dresden or Detroit, financed by Lazare Frere in Paris or the Morgan Bank in New York, enabled by judicious gifts from Bechtel in San Francisco and Halliburton of Houston to the local political elite, throws a blue throb of light across the cheekbone of the 14-year-old girl who walks up to you in front of the Shangri-La Hotel and says in plausible English, how about a party, big guy? Um, I, I have more to say on that subject in a minute, but I'm going to. Uh, this is a poem called "Time and Materials." I was uh, given the assignment and the pleasure of living with a series of uh, suite of abstract paintings by Gerhard Richter that were in show in San Francisco Museum of Modern Art for for a while, with the assignment of writing something about them. Quite amazing paintings. Anyway, this is called Time and Materials. First, to make layers, as if they were a steadiness of days. It snowed. I did errands at a desk, a white flurry at the window, thickening. My tongue tasted of the glue on envelopes. On this day, sunlight on red brick, bare trees, nothing stirring in the icy air. On this day, a blur of color moving where the heat from bodies meets the watery, cold surface of the glass. Made love, made curry, talked on the phone to friends. The one whose brother died was crying and thinking alternately, like someone falling down and getting up and running and falling and getting up. The object of this poem is not to annihilate to not annihilate the object of this poem is to report a theft in progress of everything that is not these words or their disposition on the page. The object of this poem is to report a theft in of everything that exists that is not the words and their position on the page. The object this poem is to report theft progress. It's, Exists, exists words 
Oops. Page. To score. To scar. To smear. To streak. To smudge. To blur. To gouge. To scrape. Action painting. That is, the painter gets to behave like time. The typo would be painting. Action painting to abraid or to render time and stand outside the horizontal rush of it for a moment to have the sensation of standing outside the greenish rush of it, some vertical gesture then, the way that anger or desire can rip a life apart, some wound of color. I'm going to go from that to another poem about time. Uh, It's a narrative poem. Um, I guess conceived in something like the spirit of um, Robert Frost's narrative poems, which I think are conceived in the spirit of uh, 17th century dialogues between the body and the soul. This one is called Then Time. In winter... In a small room, a man and a woman have been making love for hours, exhausted, very busy, wringing out each other's bodies. They look at each other suddenly and laugh. What is this, he says. I can't get enough of you, she says, a woman who thinks of herself as not given to cliché. She runs her fingers across his chest, tentative touches, as if she were testing her wonder. He says... Me too. And she, beginning to be herself again, you mean you can't get enough of you either? (laughs) I mean, he takes her in his hands and shakes them. Where does this come from? She cocks her head and looks into his face. Do you really want to know? Yes, he says. Self-hatred, she says. Longing for God kisses him again. It's not what it is. Wry shrug. It's where it comes from. Kisses his bruised mouth a second time, a third. Years later, in another city, they're having dinner in a quiet restaurant near a park. Fall. Earlier that day, hard rain. Leaves, brass-colored and smoky crimson flying everywhere. Twenty years older, she is very beautiful, an astringent person. She'd become, she said, an obsessive gardener, her daughter's grown. He's trying not to be overwhelmed by love or pity because he sees she has no hands. He thinks she must have given them away. He imagines very clearly how she wakes some mornings, He has a vivid memory of her younger self, stirred from sleep, flushed, just opening her eyes, to momentary horror because she can't remember what she did with them, why they're gone. And then she remembers and calms herself so that the day takes on its customary sequence once again. She asks him if he thinks about her. Occasionally, he says, smiling, and you... Not much, she says. I think it's because we never existed inside time. He studies her long fingers, a pianist's hands, or a gardener's, strong, much used, as she fiddles with her wine glass, and he understands vaguely that it must be his hands that are gone. Then he's describing a meeting that he'd sat in all day, chaired by someone they'd felt many years before mutually superior to. You know the expression, a perfect fool, she'd said to him, and he had liked her tone so much. Now she begins the story of the company in Maine she orders bulbs from, begun by a Polish refugee married to a French-Canadian separatist from Quebec. It's a story with many surprising turns and a rare chocolate black lily at the end. He's listening, studying her face, still turning over her remark. He decides that she thinks more symbolically than he does and that it seemed to have saved her for all her fatalism from certain kinds of pain. 
She finds herself thinking what a literal man he is, notices as if she were recalling it, his pleasure in the menu and the cooking and the architecture of the room. It moves her in the way that earnest limitation can be moving. And she is moved by her attraction to him, also by what he was to her. She sees her own avidity to live then, or not to not have lived might be more accurate, from a distance the way a driver might see from the road a startled deer running across an open field in the rain. A wild thing, here and gone. Death made it poignant. Or if not, death exactly, which she'd come to think of as creatures seething in a compost heap. Then time. Um... So here is another little narrative poem that came out of the experience of, of um, reading that and thinking, oh, I can write narrative poems. <laughs> Unfashionable. What fun. <laughs> this is called Drift and Vapor Surf Faintly. How much damage do you think we do, he says, making love this way when we can hardly stand each other? I can stand you, she says. You're the rare person I can always stand. Well, yes, but you know what I mean. I'm not sure I do. I think I'm more lighthearted about sex than you are. I think it's a little tiresome to treat it like a fucking sacrament. <laughs> not much of a pun, not much. <laughs> she licks tiny wavelets of dried salt from the soft flesh of his inner arm. He reaches up to whisk sand from her breast. And I like you, mostly. I don't think you can expect anyone's imagination to light up over the same person all the time. Sand, peppery flecks of it, cling to the rosy, puckered skin of her areola in the cooling air. He studies it, squinting, then licks her nipple lightly. Mm. I'm angry. You're not really here. We come as if we were opening a wound. Speak for yourself. A young woman wearing the ochre apron of the hotel staff emerges from the dune grass in the distance. She carries snow-white towels. They watch her stack on a table under an umbrella made of palm fronds. Look, I know you're hurt, and I think you want me to feel guilty, and I don't. I don't want you to feel guilty. What do you want, then? I don't know. Dinner. The woman <laughs> is humming something. They hear snatches of fading and rising on the breeze. The woman says... That's the girl who lost her child last winter. She's slipping into her suit top. He says, poor kid, and squirms into his trunks. Um, so this is a, a poem called uh, uh, I, I heard C.D. Wright give a really wonderful lecture, and she used the phrase of poetry as an escape from the desert of rationality. And it made me want to defend deserts and rationality. <laughs> so, so this is, anyway. White of forgetfulness, white of safety. My mother was burning in a closet. Creek water wrinkling over stones. Sister Damien, in fifth grade, loved teaching mathematics. Her full white sleeve, when she wrote on the board, swayed like the slow movement of a hunting bird, egret in the tidal flats, swan paddling in a pond. Let A equal the distance between X and Y. Inca doves in the desert, their cinnamon covers when they flew. People make arguments. 
They have reasons for their appetites. A child can see it isn't true. In the picture of the Last Supper on the classroom wall, all the apostles had beautiful pastel robes, each one the color of a flavor of sherbet. A line is the distance between two points. A point is indivisible, not a statement of fact, a definition. It took you a second to understand the difference, and then you loved it. You loved reason, moving as a swan moves in a mill stream. I would not have betrayed the Lord before the cock crowed thrice, but I was a child. What could a child do when they came for him? Ticking heat and the scent of sage, of penny royal, the structure of every living thing was praying for rain. Um, Let's see, I have two more poems to read before reading the last little set of poems. Um, I, someone asked me to read an old poem, and I will, I'm happy to do it. And it's called Meditation at Lagunitas. This is, you, this is a poem you're sort of cursed to write one poem that always gets anthologized, and this one also gets translated. And one of the things I have to t- say to you that in Serbian, the word for uh, blackberry is shpurt. <laughs> <laughs> Meditation at Lagunitas. <clears throat> All the new thinking is about loss. In this, it resembles all the old thinking, the idea, for example, that each particular erases the luminous clarity of a general idea, that the clown-faced woodpecker probing the dead sculpted trunk of that black birch is, by his presence, some tragic falling off from a first world of undivided light. Or the other notion that because there is in this world no one thing to which the bramble of blackberry corresponds, a word is elegy to what it signifies. We talked about it late last night, and in the voice of my friend, there was a thin wire of grief, a tone almost querulous. After a while, I understood that talking this way, everything dissolves. Justice, pine, hair, woman, you, and I. There was a woman I made love to, and I remembered how holding her small shoulders in my hand sometimes, I felt a violent wonder at her presence, like a thirst for salt. From my childhood river with its island willows, silly music from the pleasure boat, muddy places where we caught the little orange silver fish called pumpkin seed. It hardly had to do with her. Longing, we say, because desire is full of endless distances. I must have been the same to her, but I remember so much. The way her hands dismantled bread the thing her father said that hurt her, what she dreamed. There are moments when the body is as numinous as words, days that are the good flesh continuing. Such tenderness, those afternoons and evenings, saying, Blackberry, Blackberry, Blackberry. So I'm going to read, I think, three more poems. And uh, actually, this is a prose piece, and it's called A Poem. You would think God would relent. Richard Eberhardt, the American poet, wrote during World War II, listening to the fury of aerial bombardment. Of course, God is not the cause of aerial bombardment. During the Vietnam War, the United States hired the Rand Corporation to conduct a study of the effect on the peasantry of Vietnam of the policy of saturation bombing of the countryside, which had at least two purposes, 
to defoliate and clear the tropical forests as a way of locating the enemy and killing the enemy if they happen to be in the way of either the concussion bombs or the fire bombs. The Rand Corporation sent a young scholar named Leon Gouret to Vietnam. He spoke no Vietnamese, but he did speak French, and some French was understood by the farmers of the Mekong Delta and the mountainous hillside farm region around Hue. Gouret conducted interviews in both regions. He concluded that the incidental damage to civilian lives from the bombing was very considerable, that the villagers were very angry, and that they blamed the Viet Cong, the insurrection the insurrectionist army the United States was fighting and not the United States because they thought of the Viet Cong as their legitimate government and felt it wasn't protecting them from the United States bombs. Seeing that the bombing was effectively alienating the peasantry from the enemy Vietnamese, Robert McNamara, General William Westmoreland, and President Lyndon Johnson recommended an intensification of the bombing. In the end, there were more bombs dropped on the villages and forests of South Vietnam than were dropped in all of World War II. The estimated Vietnamese casualties during the war is two million. It was a war whose principal strategy was terror. More Iraqi civilians have now been incidental casualties of the U.S. bombing of Iraq than were killed by Arab terrorists in the destruction of the World Trade Center. In the first 20 years of the 20th century, 90% of war deaths were the deaths of combatants. In the last 20 years of the 20th century, 90% of war deaths were the deaths of civilians. There is a simple enough response to these facts. The nations of the world could abolish the use of aerial bombardment in warfare. You would think men would relent. And this is uh, this, if I can find it. One moment here. Uh, oh, I hate it when I do this. Just one second, and I'll find this piece. So I got it out and it seems to have completely disappeared. Just give me one minute. There's some there. A ton of others I could read. I did have in mind reading you this poem. Sorry. So this is called I Am Your Waiter Tonight and My Name is Dimitri. <laughs> it's a poem by John Ashbery and has no investment in the fact that you can get an adolescent male of the human species to do almost anything, which is why they are wearing combat gear in 115 degree weather in Baghdad this morning and why a young girl is strapping 20 pounds of explosives to her chest in Nablum. Dulce et decorum pro patria mori. Have I mentioned that the other law of human nature is that human beings become capable of doing whatever they have seen someone else do and that someone will do anything? There is probably a waiter in this country so creepy that he thinks his nickname is Damit Tree. That would be one explanation. American amnesia is such that he may very well be the grandson of the elder Karamazov brother who fled to the American Middle West with his girlfriend, Grushenka. He never killed his father. It isn't true that he killed his father. But his religion was that woman's honey-colored head, an ideal tangible enough to die for, and he lived for it in Buffalo, New York, or Sandusky, Ohio. He never learned much English 
but he slept beside her in the night until she was an old woman who still knew her way to the Russian pharmacist in the suburb of Chicago where she could buy sachets of the herbs of the Russian summer that her coarse white nightgown still smelled of as he fell asleep, though he smoked Turkish cigarettes and could hardly smell. Grushika got two boys out of her body, one in 1894 and one in 1896, the one born in 1894 having died at the Battle of the Somme from a piece of shrapnel manufactured by Alfred Nobel. Metal traveling at that speed can do amazing things to the tissues of the human intestine. The other son began working construction the year his mother died. If they could, they would have, if not filled, half filled her coffin with the petals of buckfleet, buckwheat flowers from which Crimean bees make the honey bought in the honey market in St. Petersburg, not far from the place where Raskolnikov, having himself an adolescent male, killed the old woman moneylender in a fit of genius guilt which went something like this, since the world evidently consists in the exploitation and prostitution of women, except the holy virtuous ones who are so self-sacrificing they make you crazed with guilt. And if I am going to be the world, then I might as well kill this female money limber who symbolizes both usury and the guilt the virtue and suffering of women induces in men. I frankly admit that the syntax of that sentence has escaped me. I step over it lightly. Raskolnikov, not far from the honey market, not far from the hay market. It is important to remember that human cities in the 19th century were the site official of horsewhipping. Humans had some ten centuries before domesticated the race of horses, harnessed them, whipped them mercilessly, according to the novels of the period in Vienna, Prague, Naples, Boston, and New York, and fed them hay. So, of course, there was in every European city a hay market, like the one in which Raskolnikov, whose name was Eugene, not Dmitri, kissed the earth from a longing for salvation. Grushenka, though Dostoevsky made her, disliked novels of ideas. Her oldest son, a master carpenter, eventually got a degree in civil engineering from Bucknell University. He married an Irish girl from Vermont who was the granddaughter of Emily Dickinson's gardener, but that's another story. Their son in Iwo Jima died, gangrene, but he left behind in the body of a Russian Jewish girl from Minsk the fetal curl of what became the most gorgeous dancer in the Cleveland Ballet. Radiant Tanya, who turned in a bad knee sometime in the Richard Nixon 1970s, just after her brother aided at Cow Dai Jin for motherhood. Which brings us to our waiter. Dimitri, you will have noticed, is not in Baghdad. He doesn't even want to be an actor. He has been offered roles in several major motion pictures and refused them because his job is to be a waiter in New York and he is in fact under contract to John Ashbery who won't release him from the poem because he understands very well that you could get killed out there. His mother says something about having come across a lock, the fetal curl of a honey-colored lock of his great-grandmother's Crimean honeybee-colored Russian spring wildflower sachet-scented hair in the attic, where it released for her in the July heat and the warm midsummer dark, that odor like life itself lived somewhere freely and without the martial attitudes of fresh of flesh rendering violence. Here is your sea bass with a light lemon and caper sauce. Here are your raspberries and chocolate with their transfiguration of the colors of blood and shit. And here, Earth's apotheosis are the flecks of sugared and crystallized lavender that stipple it. Finally, in this concluding <coughs> rant, think of, uh, of Zukovsky's A9. Um, is a poem that at the moment is called Bush's War. I typed the brief phrase Bush's War at the top of a sheet of white paper having some dim intuition of a poem made luminous by reason that would, though I did not have them at hand, set the facts out in an orderly way. 
Berlin is a northerly city. In May, in Berlin, at the end of the 20th century, in the leafy precincts of Dahlendorf, south of the Grunewald, near Krumalanka, the spring is a northern spring. What a racket of bird songs. Amsels sing like crazy in the trees. There are two kinds of flowering chestnuts, red and white, and the wet walkways are thick with petals of their incandescent spikes, and the odor of lilac is everywhere. In Oscar Hellenheim station, a farmer is selling white asparagus from a heaped table. In a month, he'll be selling chanterelles. In a month after that, strawberries and crawfish from the spree. The stalks of white asparagus are so phallic and tender and delicately pale, their seasonal appearance must be the remnant of some old fertility ritual of the German tribes. They have special menus in the restaurants. They serve up heaped platters with boiled potatoes and butter or shavings of parma ham and lemon juice or sorrel and smoked salmon. And walking home in the widening, slant, brilliant northern light that falls on the new-leaved birches and the elms, a nightingale is singing at the first subtlest darkening of dusk. Flash forward, the firebombing of Hamburg, 50,000 dead in a single night, the children's bodies the next day set in the street in rows like a market in charred chicken. Flash forward, the firebombing of Tokyo, 100,000 in a night. Flash forward, 45,000 Polish officers slaughtered by, in two days by the Russian army in the Katyn Woods. Flash forward, two million Russian prisoners of war murdered by the German army all across the Eastern Front, supplies low, winter of 1943. Flash, Hiroshima, flash, Auschwitz, flash, the gulags, seven million in Belarusia and Ukraine. In innocent Europe, on a night in spring, among the light-struck birches, students holding hands. One has a novel in her hand the German translation of a book by Marguerite Dura about a love affair in old Saigon. Flash forward, two million Vietnamese, 55,000 of the American young, whole races of tropical birds extinct from saturation bombing. The kind of book the young love to love, about love in a time of war. 45 million all told in World War II. In pretty Berlin, you are never not wondering how it happened. These Germans, too, children then, are unborn, never not wondering. Is it that we like the kissing and the bombing together? In prospect, at least, girls in their flowery dresses, always time sped up. Someone will always mobilize death on a large scale for economic domination or revenge. And the rest of us, for centuries, have gone along. Now, the well-paid newsreaders have to read their propaganda on the air. The rest of us have to agree to believe that the dead women in the rubble of Baghdad, who did not vote to die in order to be dead under another government than the dictators, are participating in something that is supposed to lead to democracy. It's not complicated. They didn't vote to die. The rest of us have to, well, this is not, of course, a poem. We do what they tell us. We activate our mild forms of rational and communal semi-resistance, and it goes on. And death the cleanser, Whitman's sweet death the scourer, tender lover, turns the heaped bodies into summer fruit, magpies eating dark berries in the dusk, bald nur, Goethe, no, Warten nur, bald ruhest du auch. Just wait, you will be quiet soon enough in Dalem, under the chestnuts, in the leafy spring. Thanks. Thanks.